So welcome to the Neuroblastoma Parent Global Symposium. I am Antonia Palmer from Neuroblastoma Canada, and I will be moderating the session entitled Umbertumab or 8H9 for CNS relapse, which will be expertly delivered by Dr. Kim Kramer. Dr. Kramer is a pediatric oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, and Dr. Kramer specializes in neuroblastoma and other cancers that have spread to this central nervous system. So before I begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit questions during the session for the speaker to address at the end. If the button is not showing, just tap or hover over the screen to bring it up. If you see a question in the list that you like, give it a thumbs up to move it up. And Dr. Kramer, it is a pleasure to see you again and thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Antonio, and I am uh, delighted to be here with many people um, across the globe. I have a few disclosures to state. Uh, I am an employee at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and MSK has partnered with YMABS Therapeutics to further develop the antibody Umbertumab. MSK has financial interest in YMABS Therapeutics, and I'm a paid consultant along with several of my study investigators. Um, the first thing I would like to say is uh, thank you to the three main organizers, CNCF, Solving Kids Cancer in the UK and Solving Kids Cancer in the United States. And uh, I mean it sincerely when I say Pat Talungan and the many people involved in Solving Kids Cancer are uh, my heroes and I know my colleagues feel similarly. Um, what I'd like to focus on are some challenges that we have had in the field of pediatric oncology and obviously brain metastasis from neuroblastoma is going to be the first one I speak about, but also uh, how this relates to other high risk and recurrent common pediatric solid tumors, including one of the more common ones that we encounter, medulloblastoma. The good news here for all of you to remember is that even though the most common intracranial brain tumor is in fact brain metastasis from solid tumors, neuroblastoma to the central nervous system is still rare. Some cancers you could see here, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, some of the more common adult carcinomas that we see have a much higher incidence of brain metastasis. And over decades, we have tracked that it's still rare uh, for neuroblastoma to metastasize. And at most, we see about 15% of children that have high-risk disease will wind up dealing uh, with the CNS metas metastasis. But the key thing that we started to see years ago is that even though it's rare, it was really one of the things that was preventing a cure. Children were otherwise cured. The treatment that was delivered systemically got rid of all the neuroblastoma, but the brain really is what we call a sanctuary site. Isolated micro metastases can exist in the central nervous system. And when we see them, and here's an example of some of these on MRI, they are usually not subtle and they cause a number of symptoms. And I've listed here the most common ones that we see. 60% of children having symptoms, headaches, seizures, sometimes their balance is off, sometimes they're just not thinking right, they may say that their vision is off, um, there's something called a facial palsy, one side of the face doesn't work symmetrically with the other, and, and then rarely um, children are just depressed, uh, a, a parent knows immediately the child is not themselves. 40% of patients in our hands are asymptomatic, and we pick these up on on routine brain imaging, including CTs or MRIs and occasionally MIBG scans. But this is the number on the bottom here that we see, 63% have only disease in the CNS, which means that the rest of the body is cured and we have to find better ways to tackle these microscopic uh, uh, cells that are, that are in the brain and spinal cord. So we noticed years ago that despite every available treatment, um, it was really, really hard to cure children once neuroblastoma came back into the brain. Um, but 
since this publication, things have gotten better. So the surgery and the surgical expertise at removing these tumors is much better. The radiation therapy is much more focused. Many of our patients today get proton therapy, which is better than the standard radiation therapy of years ago um, and can eliminate any kind of scatter to normal tissues. And then some of the drugs are better. Um, they get into the brain uh, much better. And arenatecan and temozolomide are two of those drugs that have definitely helped. But our goal here is to use these conventional therapies, the surgery, the radiation therapy, and the chemotherapy to get down to a point where we don't see any more disease on an MRI scan and that we have novel ways to eliminate any remaining microscopic cells. So now you all know the standard of care for neuroblastoma um, uh, in the rest of the body is something called antibodies that targets something called GD2, which is on the surface of neuroblastoma cells. So years ago, we were wondering, can we use these antibodies, which we know is effective in getting rid of microscopic disease in the bone or the bone marrow and address the CNS uh, sanctuary site? Now, there are ways to make an antibody more effective. There are drugs that you could add, such as GMCSF. Uh, you can change the design of the antibody so that it actually gets into certain areas that you want better, such as a single chain. You could add a form of radiation therapy, which is called an isotope directly to the antibody. And the antibody in this case serves as a carrier for the isotope to deliver targeted radiation. So we started thinking about this by delivering these radio labeled antibodies, not into the, uh, into the uh, intravenous circulation, but directly into the CNS compartment. Um, and so this, this whole type of modality is called compartmental radio labeled immunotherapy. And this is where we take the antibody that we see here, tag it with an isotope, it targets the neuroblastoma cells and could be delivered directly into the spinal fluid through uh, uh, an indwelling catheter, most commonly called Enomaya reservoir. So our two targets were anti-GD2. We did try using radio labeled anti-GD2 into the spinal fluid, um, and it certainly targets microscopic tumor cells, but it is somewhat limited because the GD2 is not specific on the tumor cells and it can cause some acute side effects like uh, headache and nausea and vomiting. And, and we believe that's because the GD2 is also expressed in other cells uh, and not tumor specific. But then there was another target, B7H3, which in contrast to GD2 has no expression on normal tissues, specifically the brain. And furthermore, the B7H3 is on many, many tumor types, not just neuroblastoma. So that includes tumors, medulloblastoma, diffuse pontine glioma, sarcomas, um, and many carcinomas. In addition, the target B7H3 has been studied in many, many other tumor types. And we know that tumors that have B7H3 expression, um, that that expression strongly correlates with increased disease spread, increased risk of current of recurrence and cancer specific deaths. And I'm li listing some of the uh, tumor uh, subtypes here with B7H3 expression, which is a negative prognostic marker. So the Chung lab many years ago developed the antibody 8H9, which is now called umbertimab. And this antibody recognizes B7H3. We know it is favorably taken up by tumor cells, specific for tumor cells has potent anti-tumor activity, could be labeled with many of the common isotopes, and that after it's labeled, that radio labeled product is stable for several days. So YMAB's Therapeutics now owns the license to this drug, and I'm gonna talk about some of the ways we have developed um, this as a therapeutic modality. Um, in our hands at MSK, patients that had any B7H3 recurrent CNS tumor um, was uh, eligible for 
this radio labeled antibody delivered into the CSF, uh, providing we had adequate blood counts, adequate organ function like liver and kidney function, and providing that we knew that the spinal fluid flow was normal. So we would make sure that if we put a drug into the spinal fluid, it's going to disperse throughout, this, throughout that spinal fluid space and the drug would go where we want it to go. One of the reasons we make sure that the CSF flow is normal, I'll show you here, this is the brain and the spinal cord. If we give a drug here, we want it to circulate throughout the whole brain and spinal cord. So this would be a typical example of a spinal fluid flow study. Um, that is done by our nuclear medicine colleagues to show that this system is working. Here you see, this is a child uh, where there is an obstruction right at the level of the ventricle there. And if we put a drug in here, um, as shown by the CSF flow study, the drug is not going up and down where we want it to go. And that could potentially cause more toxicity, but worse, it's not going where we want it to go, which is to seek out any microscopic cells in that spinal fluid. Now, if the whole system works and the spinal fluid is adequate, uh, we routinely give the radio labeled umbertamap right at the bedside. Patients are awake. Our nurse practitioners here um, have delivered hundreds of injections for children who are awake right at the bedside. Um, and we have our nuclear medicine team um, handling these injections with us. Last fall, we presented our results using compartmental radioimmune therapy with I131 labeled umbertamab for 177 patients that have brain tumors, and that includes 512 injections, 109 patients had CNS neuroblastoma, and 68 patients um, received 172 injections. Very rarely, we would see a headache or fever or vomiting, generally manageable with the drugs as you would expect, uh, uh, acetaminophen or any of the common antiemetics. The most common thing we see is that as the drug is cleared through the systemic circulation, some of the blood counts can go down, um, but we've managed to still treat and um, give growth factors, things like GCSF, uh, end plate for platelets or, or transfusions just to get the counts back up there. Um, but we did show and publish that the dose delivered to the spinal fluid is much higher than the dose delivered to the blood, which is really what we want. We also presented um, at the PSYOP conference. This is our historical control experience, and this is the 107 out of the 109 patients that re received therapy injections, tracking out as long as 15 years, um, showing that many of these patients can be cured. Um, in addition to neuroblastoma, uh, many patients had medulloblastoma or recurrent ependymoma, and there are some rare tumors. Uh, you may uh, hear about these through uh, colleagues or friends, um, some other primary brain tumors in children called ETMR, um, and then other times metastatic sarcomas or uh, melanoma. But we were happy to see that even among some of these rare, very challenging diseases to cure, we've had a number of patients that have been treated and have never uh, experienced a subsequent relapse in the brain. So our conclusions here, uh, CNS uh, CRIT radio labeled umbertamab therapy has a favorable safety profile. Um, we've, we've followed patients for many, many years, uh, favorable CSF to blood ratio, and appears to have clinical utility to treat B7H3 positive CNS tumors, including neuroblastoma, medulloblastoma, ETMR, or recurrent choroid plexus carcinomas. So one of the goals since uh, YMAPS took over the license is to show that this drug could be delivered in several other centers also. And they are the sponsor of the first ever multi-center international study of a radio-labeled conjugate targeting B7H3 for CNS neuroblastoma. So this trial opened in December of 2018. And the sites that have delivered uh, the YMAB's radio labeled antibody are MSK, 
uh, my colleague Jama Mora in Barcelona, MD Anderson, Riley Children's Hospital in Indiana, Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio, and several other centers are in the pipeline in Europe, in the United States, uh, my colleagues in Canada, and in Asia. Last month, we presented results of this trial for a planned interim analysis at SIOP 2020 um, and showed that the aims of this study, very similar to the MSK study over the 15 years, evaluating the safety, the dose that's delivered, the pharmacokinetics, how fast the drug is metabolized, and the efficacy of this radio-labeled antibody in patients with CNS neuroblastoma. Similarly, patients on this multi-center trial were eligible for treatment if they had stable systemic disease, adequate CSF flow, and adequate major organ function. The trial was designed very much like our MSK trial, two cycles of the intra-OMIA radio-labeled antibody, the dosimetry assessed by nuclear imaging, um, sampling of the spinal fluid and the blood to see how quickly it cleared, looking at the safety over a five-week period, and again, following up with scans at 26 weeks, one year, and up to three years. So at uh, the SIOP meeting last month, the interim analysis had 17 patients that were assessed, and of the 17, 10 of the patients received a full two cycles, the other seven received one and primarily didn't get a second cycle because the blood counts uh, wound up going uh, very low. But also we showed here that there was a high mean CSF to blood ratio that was achieved and the same expected side effects with low blood counts being the most common. The median follow-up on this 17 patient cohorts was slightly more than six months, so it is early but it does look like the survival here is definitely better than anything that is published in the literature or our own pre-radio-labeled umbertimab experience. Preliminary results showed that uh, delivery of this drug in a multi-center international setting is uh, feasible and it appears safe. The acute side effects are manageable with the blood counts being most commonly the side effect uh, with low blood counts. The I131 umbertimab shows a favorable therapeutic index. And so far the preliminary efficacy results support our previous findings that it has a therapeutic intervention and can improve survival of patients with CNS neuroblastoma. So where else might we go to target B7H3 with a drug that we know can really tackle micrometastasis in the brain. We are part of a multi-center consortium trial in the United States and Canada called the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium. Uh, and there are two tumors that has been really, really uh, difficult to make any uh, advances. Um, in overall survival and cure, and that are patients that have had recurrent medulloblastoma or recurrent ependymoma. So the PBTC is now undertaking a multi-center trial to use the same drug by the same route addressing these tumor cells, which we know are B7H3 positive. So for patients that have recurrent ependymoma, they'll get the standard areno temozolomide and bevacizumab chemotherapy, as has been done for years on the children's oncology group. And if things are stable, uh, they can receive 8H9 and will resume the standard chemotherapy and hope that uh, an improved survival could be met. For patients with ependymoma, ideally they would have surgery, um, possible re-irradiation, and, and then the radio-labeled antibody followed by disease surveillance. Another goal uh, is to see if there's an isotope that's better than I-131. Um, and in this regard, YMAPS is developing something called a lutetium DTPA umbertimab. So lutetium is a beta emitter, which is a type of isotope just like I-131. Um, it has a six day half-life, so a little bit shorter, um, but it's easier to label and probably easier to ship. So this drug is being developed uh, through um, 
the uh, YMABS multicenter trial as a phase one first in human trial for patients with recurrent medulloblastoma. Uh, in addition, here at MSK, trial 302 will use this lutetium DTPA umbertamab for adults with B7H3 metastatic CNS metastases. So I'd just like to mention another disease that we have had no advances, no therapeutic advances in three to four decades, and that is children with DIPG. This is a brainstem tumor. Uh, the brainstem is really the hub where all the nerves of the brain go down into the spinal cord. So if you have a big tumor that is sitting here, just about every kind of nerve function in the body could be affected. There are only about 200 children per year that are diagnosed. It does represent 10 to 15% of all childhood brain tumors. But usually patients are fine one day and they can't walk the next or they have uh, the um, problems with gait disturbances or they can't see. Um, but because of the location, these tumors are not operable. Radiation therapy has been given for decades but this is a uniformly poor uh, uh, cure rate and 90% of children uh, tend to die within a year of diagnosis. So we wanted to know, can this radio labeled antibody be delivered by a catheter directly into the brain stem and deliver a more focused form of radiation therapy, knowing that radiation therapy is the only thing that has even transiently helped these children. So this is done with many of my colleagues here, uh, led by Dr. Mark Swedain. Um, and this uh, is a first phase in phase one trial, first in human study that is designed to look at the safety and the activity of this drug into the brainstem at several uh, dose levels. Um, the results from the first dose levels were published and we are, uh, we are encouraged the the antibodies delivered here by Dr. Swedain um, directly into, this is the brain stem, and you can see the activity in serial scans over one week where the activity sits right where we want it to in the brain stem. So, so far it appears that it's safe. Uh, the, tumor, the tumor is taking up the antibody that we want. Um, the overall survival is analysis. We are trying to determine the optimal dosing and scheduling, but the ultimate question is, can this be the first agent to improve survival for patients with DIPG? So our lessons learned so far, compartmental radioimmune therapy can be successfully incorporated into treatment strategies for challenging pediatric malignancies. I've shown you that our experience over many years by the intraventricular route into the spinal fluid for metastatic CNS tumors like neuroblastoma and for primary CNS tumors, including medulloblastoma. And number two, the intratumoral administration by convection enhanced delivery for diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma can also offer another therapeutic advantage for patients with DIPG. So I have to show you how many people have been involved in these trials over the many, many years. And that includes my colleagues in pediatrics, neurology, neurosurgery, pathology, the radiology department, our radiation safety team, uh, radiation oncology, and the many research study assistants. And to give you an idea of how many people have been really uh, hands-on involved in participating in these studies. This is the uh, Chung Lab, uh, many people in the Chung Lab and many people who've uh, branched out from the Chung Lab and have gone on to other centers, which are now part of our multi-center international studies. This is uh, Dr. Lewis's lab. Um, he uh, is responsible for making sure that the radio labeling, taking that isotope and putting it onto the antibody is done successfully um, and runs all of the quality controls to make sure that the final drug um, is, is uh, exactly what we want it to be. Um, this is Jing, who uh, many times came in at four in the morning to start the radio labeling process since it takes many, many hours so that the team could deliver the drug to our young patients. 
by the early afternoon, um, very dedicated people. Our nuclear medicine team that shows that the drug is going to where we want it to go and telling us that the uh, dose to the spinal fluid is much higher than the blood. Dr. Wolden and the radiation oncology team, our research study assistants, um, Dr. Swedane, our neurosurgeon, and our nurse practitioners, mostly Maria Donzelli and Ursula Tomlinson, who have delivered the bulk of these hundreds of injections we have given um, over the many, many years. I'd also like to acknowledge our YMABS team who is really sponsoring these studies on, uh, on a multi-center international level, which was something that as a single institution, we were never able to do. So um, their efforts and their determination to make sure this is available worldwide um, have, have really been tremendous. But mostly our inspiration is from our parent body. Um, this is little Katie Hoke, who uh, I met in the, in the late uh, 90s um, when I was a fellow. Um, and Katie was one of the first patients that uh, I had ever met that had neuroblastoma. And this is her mom, Gina, who uh, raises money decades later, even after Katie has passed, to make sure that uh, children have better treatment today, better treatments that were not available uh, for Katie many years ago. Um, this uh, is also to acknowledge so many people who are involved in philanthropic uh, organizations that have raised money to support this research at the grassroots level. And I, I hope you know that we appreciate um, every ounce of uh, your efforts. Um, it, it's hard to put into words uh, how moved we are by um, the decades of support that you have shown us and that you've continued to show us. And we hope to provide better treatments for uh, all of these innocent children. And with that, I'll turn it over to my good friend for years, my Canadian colleague, Antonio, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. We have uh, quite a few questions that are coming through in the Q&A. Um, one question that I would like to ask is you had mentioned that some MIBG scans are able to detect disease in the CNS. Uh, if you, do you think that um, a brain MRI should become a standard scan for high-risk neuroblastoma? You know, it's a great question. Uh, we scan a lot. We put our patients through so many scans and bone marrow tests and MIBG questions, but uh, MIBG studies. But the reason for that is not any one of these tests is going to detect the disease everywhere. In order for an MIBG scan to pick up a brain metastasis, it has to be located in an area where there's a high amount of blood flow. So the radioactivity from the MIBG that's been injected intravenously can get to the tumor. Often it has to reach a certain size, several centimeters before you can detect it on an MIBG scan. And so for the brain disease, nothing has replaced an MRI scan. And so, you know, yes, we routinely do MRIs and we do them very commonly at, at the time of diagnosis and serially moving forward. But we also recognize that 90%, 85% to 90% of our children are getting these MRIs knowing that the MRIs are gonna be clean, um, the, the chances of having the brain relapse is low but we're trying to capture early the 10 to 15% of patients that will have a brain metastasis and hoping that we can detect it before the symptoms occur, um, before uh, things may become very difficult for a surgeon to remove. Um, and so, you know, we advocate for that, but I completely understand why many centers will not scan unless a patient has had symptoms. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, 8H9 does not really have an impact on the whole body, um, but there are many patients who do not receive a second cycle of 8H9 due to low blood counts. 
Um, so what's happening with the low blood counts and the, AD, the connection with 8H9, or is this in some way a connection to uh, previous treatment that the child has experienced? Okay, uh, another really terrific question. When we gave the radio-labeled Umbertamab to patients that didn't have prior brain and spine radiation therapy or prior transplant, the counts tended not to go low. But in our patients that have had the brain recurrence, they have invariably had multiple cycles of high-dose chemotherapy, the cranial spinal radiation. Some of our patients have had one or two uh, high-dose transplant or stem cell reinfusion type of therapies. And so their bone marrow is really weak. So while the B7H3 isn't there specifically in the bone marrow, as the drug is cleared and as the isotope is cleared through the system, the I131 has some non-specific reactivity on the bone marrow and the side effects from any kind of radiation therapy or really any kind of isotope can be lowering of the blood counts. So it is really impossible for us to avoid the secondary effect of the low blood counts as the drug is clearing in a patient who has a marginal bone marrow supply uh, at the beginning. As a follow on to that question, if low blood counts is an obstacle for patients to receive uh, the second dose of 8H9, is there a role for a stem cell rescue for these patients? Uh, and, and additionally, would stem cell harvest prior to 8H9 therapy be feasible if a patient does not have stem cells that have, are in storage and have been harvested? Yes, so if stem cells are variable, we, we worry much less about the low blood counts because we have a backup. When we looked at patients that had one cycle versus two cycles of the antibody, we still have a ton of children that have been cured after one cycle. So unless we see something on a scan where we really think additional therapy is needed and we need to use up those precious bone marrow cells, those precious stem cells, which are available, then we try not to uh, because those are uh, a limited quantity. And we, we, we know that many of these children can be cured even after one cycle. So we try not to use up that resource. Is there a typical window of occurrence uh, for a CNS relapse after frontline therapy? Yeah. Um, another great question. We've looked at that over decades. And by and large, if the neuroblastoma comes back in the brain, it happens within the one year to 18 to 24 month window after the neuroblastoma therapy has been completed. Um, certainly after the chemotherapy part of induction treatment for high-risk neuroblastoma has been completed. Uh, very, very rarely does it ever happen later. Um, and in fact, if there's a, an abnormality on a, on a brain scan years and years later after neuroblastoma treatment that happens to be obtained for some other reason, uh, we, we find the other reason for having that abnormality there and, and virtually always eliminating neuroblastoma as being, as being one of the culprits. And if a patient is receiving a regular brain MRIs post a high risk treatment uh, as part of their aftercare, is there a time frame that you recommend when, uh, when you can stop doing the brain MRIs? You know, pretty much after the two to three years, if everything is fine and there's no clinical reason to get a brain MRI, we stop. Now, sometimes patients have the brain MRI for other reasons. They had skull radiation or our endocrinologists are making sure that there's nothing there that explains uh, growth hormone if there happens to be low or there are a whole host of other reasons why a, a child may have an MRI, but generally it's not because we're expecting that 
the risk of neuroblastoma in the brain is there. Thank you. Um, and are there any effective strategies or efforts that, um, that we can engage to be able to prevent CNS relapse? We haven't been able to prevent it. Um, and it is still a challenge to figure out why it happens in the first place. Um, you know, uh, many years ago, we thought maybe just like the anti-GD2 therapy in the vein is given, even if you can't see anything there, maybe we should give the radio-labeled antibody before we ever see any neuroblastoma uh, in the brain. But it is really hard to recommend this therapy knowing that 90% of children are not going to be dealing with this. Um, and that's very different from other types of pediatric cancers like leukemia, where years ago it was shown that if you didn't give drugs into the spinal fluid for leukemia, when a child was diagnosed with leukemia, almost 100% of children would have the leukemia cells come back into the spinal fluid. So it was a clear need uh, because removing that prophylactic treatment, you, you knew what was going to happen. And administering the prophylactic treatment completely changed the cure rate for leukemia. When something still happens so rarely, like the neuroblastoma in the brain, um, we proposed a prophylactic trial, but our institutional review board felt that it was still rare enough that we could not uh, administer uh, the drug when 90% of children are probably not going to need it. Is there any work being done to understand what children will potentially have a CNS neuroblastoma relapse? So, you know, the Chung Lab is really working hard on looking at genes that may be expressed in the tumor cells um, at the time of diagnosis to see whether they are more active or whether they are unique in um, children that have the brain metastasis. And uh, knowing the dedication efforts that the Chung Lab has been pursuing, I trust that we may one day find that, that answer. Is CNS neuroblastoma relapse more common for endemic amplified disease? A little bit, yes. But we still have dozens and dozens of children that don't have MIC amplified disease that still get it. So slightly more common, yes, but it's not the total answer. And for that matter, there are still so many children that have MIC and amplified disease that don't develop CNS neuroblastoma. So it may be part of why these tumors grow quickly and they're a little bit more aggressive, but it, uh, it is, does not explain it all. And what about the Atrox mutation? Uh, yep, that is definitely one of the ones that can be found in some of these CNS tumors as well. Are there maintenance therapies for children after treatment with 8H9? So uh, I mentioned the leukemia story because we know that once children get the drugs into the spinal fluid for leukemia, if you don't treat on the on the blood side, the bone marrow side, again, you can get rid of the cells in the spinal fluid, but then the cells come back in the bone marrow. And so we have typically recommended uh, four cycles of an oral chemotherapy drug that we know gets into the, the blood and the brain side, temozolomide, as well as four cycles of anti-GD2 therapy, if we can administer that as well, um, just to try to prevent uh, another systemic recurrence. And again, borrowing on the experience from our colleagues in, in other areas within pediatric oncology. Thank you so much, okay. Dr. All right, I wish you all the best. And, and if any patients have some questions uh, and, and wanna shoot them to your way, and Tony, if we didn't get to them, you can channel them my way and I'll, and I'll do my best, okay?
Thank you. So thank you again for your very you. informative and insightful presentation. And thank you to everyone watching. We're sorry we couldn't get to every question, but we will try to answer and follow up by email. Uh, so we have the next sessions will come up after the break. Um, we have the Taximab, the HU3F8 studies, and the importance of aftercare and long-term follow-up. So remember, if you miss a session, uh, we uh, will be available to watch shortly after the live session ends on the on-demand page on the event, events website. Thank you very much.